The Fearless Podcast, in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. All right, y'all, welcome back to The Fearless Podcast. This is episode 45, and before we get started, I have an awesome guest, but before we get started, I want to shout out today's sponsors. I want to notify everybody that's local. For local pickup, we still have one quarter of beef left, so check out the thetexasboys.com. Reserve that last quarter if you're interested and are available for local pickup in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Uh, so that's our first sponsor. Second sponsor is Exit and Build Land Summit 4. We went last year. It was an awesome event. Um, I'll put the links down below. John Bush has put together a great um just, just a great meeting. Uh, Joel Salatin's going to be there. Mike Adams, uh, Jack Spearco, lots of awesome speakers. Got a lot of great information last year. Um, so those links will be down below. And then lastly, foodforestnursery.com. They sell bare root fruit trees. Now is the time to buy and plant bare root fruit trees. If you use the Texas Boys 10, you'll get 10% off. And that's our sponsors for the show today. All the links will be down below. So please check them out. We greatly appreciate them. And uh, without further delay, I want to welcome Charlie from Yanasa TV. And uh, me and Charlie have been kind of trying to make our schedules work. And uh, I appreciate him taking the time to talk to y'all. Hey, Charlie, how you doing today? Pretty good. How are you doing? Great, great, great. Um, yeah, so I wanted Charlie on. Um, I think he has a very interesting story. Um, and when you're in this, um, farming, ranching, homesteading, uh, community, so to speak, this, this, this homestead tsunami that Joel Salatin talks about, um, I love, I love interviewing people that are part of this tsunami because we started our adventure 10 years ago by relocating to Texas. And it's so neat when you get to hear other people's stories and a lot of them that started around the same time and we have a lot of overlap and interest. So Charlie, maybe we could kind of start out with your origin story, you and your wife, like what your backgrounds were and then what you're doing now. Yeah. So my wife and I, we met back in uh, 2012. I think we were, we were married in 2015 and, and we had both had corporate careers in opposite spectrums. I ran a commercial real estate firm up in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she was in um, financial advisory down in Southern Pines, North Carolina. So we both grew up having farms in our families at some point in time, and we wanted our kids to be able to have that type of life as well. So we bought a farm kind of centralized between the two places we worked. And um, it had an old farmhouse on it, so we had to completely rebuild it. And that's kind of what brought us out to the country. It wasn't to get into homesteading. It wasn't, you know, any of that. We just wanted to have the land, to have the recreation for the kids. We, you know, rode horses, four wheelers, that type of thing. And then what happened was uh, shortly after we began, we began work, uh, we got hit with several uh, things that completely changed our lives. Um, my wife got uh, pregnant with our youngest and um, was put on bed rest. And so she was stuck inside this camper on our farm um, pretty much for several months until he was born. And then I uh, ran into a problem with our contractor on the house and had to take over as a general contractor. So I couldn't operate a business up in Raleigh and handle our farm, which was 45 minutes away and, and, operate as the GC. Plus we had to get the house done pretty quickly. So we both ended up uh, leaving our jobs because of that situation. We eventually got the house done after about a year of renovations and moved into it. Um, but that whole scenario changed our career paths. We had to kind of reinvent ourselves and having a real estate background, I had gotten into um, agricultural property sales and we would go out and create elaborate videos on farms to try and, you know, sell the farms to other farmers. And um, from that, we started getting calls to go out and film rodeos, agricultural events for the state and things like that. And that just kind of took over. Um, we, we fell into that career path up until about COVID and then COVID just shut everything down. 
Um, and along that journey, we we grew in our knowledge of agriculture because we were around it constantly. We were filming it. We had to become intimately um, familiar with farming practices. And we started uh, transitioning our own farm from recreational purposes to actually creating our own food, having animals, chickens. Um, and so, you know, once COVID hit, you know, it started to really kind of sink in that we can't depend on our supply chain anymore. I mean, we have to be prepared ourselves. And for us, we were actually in a fairly decent situation by the time that happened. But um, for a lot of other people, they were just coming into the knowledge of how fragile the supply chain actually is. So um, the other thing that we noticed happen, happening around that same time frame is there was a lot of negative uh negative narratives being thrown out against the agricultural industry as a whole, um, farmers, homesteaders. And, and a lot of that has, you know, goes back to, you know, animal husbandry practices, climate, whatever it is that they could throw at us. It's felt like that narrative was coming out and it was being put out there by nonprofit organizations. They were getting funding through grants and special interests um, one of the big cases I can remember back then was the the hog farmers in North Carolina. It was real easy to go after them because they supplied Smith, uh, Smithfield and nobody liked uh, Smithfield Farms because it was bought out by China. But what ended up happening was a bunch of nuisance lawsuits came in, put generational farmers out of business because they um, could no longer operate. And a lot of the funding that was going into those nuisance suits was actually coming from their competition, which would be the, um, at that time, you know, the stuff like Impossible Burger, Beyond Burgers, the same investors that you saw investing in those that were trying to take those companies public at the time were then turning around and also using their funds to fund these groups that would go in and basically sue and shut down their competition. So it's all fair, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, and and you've continued to kind of see that unfold. I mean, there's five or six cases that I can mention today where you're seeing the same thing happen throughout our country. Um, so we wanted to, you know, we, we couldn't film because COVID shut everything down. So we decided to start this our own nonprofit to go out and tell the truth about agricultural and farming. And um, since that time, we've we put out a, a farm series that was kind of the first thing we did where we traveled around. We covered about eight or so different farms in the Midwest and the East Coast. And then for the last several years, we've been working on a larger documentary um, where we've filmed in across the U.S. and Canada filming the American bison. And the reason why we're doing that is because if you want to understand how our ecology evolved and the importance of having ruminants and ungulates on on the land you have to understand you know one of the the keystone species of north america because that's pretty much what built our ecology that the the massive amount of bison and you know with that documentary you, you do learn a lot about ruminants their impacts on our on our environment um, but the other thing that we've learned in filming it is how you know the 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 agricultural indus industry side of bison of the bison community actually helps with the conservation side and the indigenous American side. And, and you really see with that particular group, we call it the bison community because they, they see themselves more of a uh, community than, than different entities, how they all have worked together to basically take a species that was on the brink of extinction and, and, and turn it back into over a half a million today. I think the numbers were getting pretty high before the drought. But um, so it's an amazing story of seeing how these different groups of people have worked together. Um, but it also helps you understand the importance of having an, a system that is economically sustainable behind all of that to help, you know, the, the bison come back. So it's some really interesting stuff we've been learning over the years. And then on top of that, you know, we we've been growing our own farm and our homestead and developing our own knowledge is, you know, as far as that goes for my wife is making all sorts of stuff out of dairy in our fridge. I call them science experiments, but <laughs> <laughs> that's great. It's, it's so important too, because what you're doing is preserving history 
uh, what gets lost in this kind of postmodern technocratic, whatever you want to call society now, um, is, you know, this land of opportunity. The reason it was such an opportunity was we have this large landmass with such a diversified, um, diversified regions from desert to uh, meadow to uh, high desert and, and uh, you know, the, the heartland and where all of this food production historically has been coming from for our country is because of the previous infrastructure, which, which it wasn't warehouses and trains and all these different things. It was the natural systems that God created. You know, he, he creates this dirt and grass and then he puts these animals on it and then as you start studying um holistic management or regenerative ag or whatever you want to call it you know you can see how once man interacts with that animal on the arable land it becomes a force multiplier and it creates abundance and uh that that's really lost on our culture today because you know everything comes in a um, plastic package from a warehouse uh, that's highly processed. So people don't even understand like how food originates. And that's, what's really important about this bison documentary and learning why was, why was this land so fertile? Where, where did all this opportunity come from? And uh, you know, cause that the only thing that's going to uh, curve this, path we're on is knowledge and education and it's great that you're you're taking the time to time caps on document you know this history that's systematically being erased yeah and it, like you said the education side of it is one of the most important things we could all do right now because there there's so much miseducation coming mm -hmm. out um i mean i i literally read things every day where you have people wanting to just you know remove animals from places like the front range of colorado and what they don't realize is that when they do that th that entire area will slowly turn into a desert because yeah. you have to have it when you're when you're in those dry environments which is a good swath of the center of america where it's often too dry for the vegetation to break down itself. So you need the moisture in the rumen of that animal to be able to break it down, turn it into fresh soil. Um, so without these animals, it would, it would perish pretty much. And um, a lot of it, you know, people want to, you know, stop people from, from ranching. I mean, that's the kind of their end goal, but um, you know, as people, we've been given the knowledge to be able to, understand how these systems work and 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 make it work like you said in abundance and um so you know when you when you put it all together um it's really it's a remarkable system i mean we've been agrarians for thousands of years uh, you know even um a lot of the native american communities here in the united states were agrarians there were a few that um that moved from place to place, but then there were many, especially in the Southeast that were agrarian cultures. They, they grew crops, they grew food and they had knowledge of how to do that, to make it work, um, to the, to the best of their abilities for the land and for them. And, um, that's knowledge that we all have today. Um, and it, you know, people often talk about, you know, it, in the film, combining Western knowledge with indigenous knowledge to really kind of understand how all that comes together. And it, you know, it's a, it's a pretty remarkable story. <laughs> if you think about yeah, it, what's, what's even neater, you know, once again, going back to this regenerative agriculture, holistic management or what have you, you know, we have all these crises and they're, they're using pseudoscience to basically deconstruct the, the their, they, them, and those, the oligarchy, or however you want to reference them, uh, they're totally fine with transnational corporations like consolidating and buying up all the beef processing and chickens and, and pigs and all that stuff. Uh, but they want to use these um, crises, whether or not they're even crises or not, uh, to 
penalize and uh, dissemble the the average the 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 average farmer, you know, the backyard fir- farmer or the small scale farmer. And what we actually see is, you know, they'll they'll complain about PFAS and forever chemicals or microplastics. But what what we're seeing with people that are actually doing the work and are involved with regenerative ag that, uh, for example, with soil biome, these forever chemicals between um, biochar and uh, uh, proper soil food web, these forever chemicals are either getting sequestered or are being deconstructed. And uh, uh, the same thing with um, the microplastics, like this stuff is getting broken down and reabsorbed back into the environment. And so it's not like a permanent thing that the soil is permanently destroyed. And so we need the government to buy it so that they can do what they do best is like, just make it a Bedouin wasteland or whatever. Um, but there's real solutions to these problems. And if we can just educate people and then if we can maintain some semblance of liberty to put these things into practice, instead of getting absorbed into some kind of like 15 minute city prison planet thing where we just are literally not capable um, by restriction, by legislation, by bureaucratic um, gobbledygook, um, you know, that's why the education component is so important. Yeah. Well, they, you know, what they're, what they've been doing in Maine, and I've heard it could be happening in other states as well, is they've been telling farmers, you can't farm your land because we've detected, you know, the small amount of PFAS there. And so we're going to offer to buy that land back for from you, or you can just sit on it for 10 years. But, um, you know, nobody is going to be better at mitigating that soil than a farmer. And and it's not like these chemicals haven't been there and they just showed up one day. They've, they've been a part of this for a while. The, the knowledge is coming out on it. And I think it's being used in a similar way that um, they've used you know, CO2, it's an invisible thing. People get afraid of it and, and they can literally walk in and shut down somebody from operating their farm, their, their private business because of it, because the, the community's so afraid of it, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous because we cook on Teflon pans. We, we do a lot of, we, I mean, they're, they're now saying forever chemicals are in band-aids. So, you, you know, there's, I mean, it's ridiculous to go in and shut down these farms, but that's what they've been doing. Um, and there's a similar situation in Denver right now. There's a, there's a bill that's been, it's a people's initiative bill that's going on the 2024 ballot where they're going to shut down a slaughterhouse. That slaughterhouse is one of the largest slaughterhouses for sheep. And we all know that we can't just take our animals anywhere we want to. Um, you, you either go through one of these big meat companies or, you wait in line for a couple of years to get an animal at your local facility. So um, this is, uh, I, I believe it's Superior Farms is the, is the brand of the meat company that they're trying to shut down. But if you think about how many small sheep farmers there are that feed into that particular plant in Denver, um, they would have an impact on every single one of those farmers. And they pitch it as these are industrial farmers they make right. you envision a CAFO. They don't want you to see these sheep wandering the hills the way that they actually are. Um, and they also pitch it as the slaughterhouse is creating th- this particular zip code is one of the most polluted zip codes in the U.S., which is true. But they're making it sound like it's because of the slaughterhouse, which it isn't. The, the chemicals that are in the ground, it's, it's a super f- uh, fun site. Uh, I think is what they call it, but they've been there since the 1800s. And so, you know, you have to ask the question, okay, is it worth it to shut this facility down and all these farmers all around? um, It's not going to change what's in the ground there, but then they want to build a, an inclusive city in its place, a mixed use development. Um, And once they force them out of business, force somebody out of their private business, they want to then go in and develop it. 
but the the chemicals that are in that that what makes that place so um polluted is the fact that you have i-70 and i-25 both running through the neighborhood and then you've got this super fund of chemicals that are in the ground from years of industrial manufacturing in my perspective it might be better to leave the slaughterhouse in that area and because you know you don't want to move these things around and, and have things popping up all over the, the country that would be causing environmental waste. But the slaughterhouse is not what has caused that problem. And, and the waste isn't even, doesn't even compare to some of the other uh, industrial facilities that are in there. Um, the other thing I've noticed about stuff like this is in that bill, they say it's not okay to kill animals for food but it is okay to kill animals for animal testing. And this is coming from an animal rights group. So it kind of gives you a direction on their motive and who's funding them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. And what's, what's even more fascinating, right. Is like when you, when you show people the nefariousness of these different bills and everything, right. You're fear mongering, right. You're this tinfoil hat, conspiracy realist right and you're fear-mongering meanwhile they're saying well forever chemicals are in band-aids and band-aids are killing us so uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean it's true that. they're yeah. saying it could you know band-aids <laughs> can now cause cancer i cut myself a lot so i mean i i wear a lot of bandages <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but you know, you're you're the fear monger because you're pointing out what the bureaucracy is doing to literally uh, de destroy the the incomes. One to remove historical um, uh, people take take away people's lands that they've inherited as a legacy, as a like a family legacy they've inherited this and we're having hard enough problems with farmers just staying in the industry to produce food to feed the eight billion people um and but at the same time they're systematically trying to destroy all the farms you know problem reaction solution you know they're create they're making the problem worse so that they can come up with some technocratic solution that involves a uh, a large commercial warehouse and uh, uh, we're going to grow bugs for protein and we're going to lab print meat and don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And, you know, we just, we just stole Joe's property from him. I mean, kill, cows are bad, but, and the solution is to grow crickets in a warehouse and, and eat lab printed meat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it also, you have to look at some of this and realize that it, it comes down to money for a lot of these people. I mean, if you have a patented food product, so you're grow your lab growing some meat, you patent that so nobody else can do it. You no longer need a farmer. You don't have to worry about dealing with hundreds of different farmers that are feeding your, your food processing facility. You control the whole thing and you get all the profits and nobody else can recreate what you've created because you've thrown a patent on it. Same goes with some of these 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 bug uh, alternative bug proteins that they're coming out with. All of it is consolidating and removing the necessity of having to have uh, people managing the land across our country, which, you know, if you look at the BLM program, somebody gave me a hard time about that the other day. Cause they were like, you know, ranchers just want to utilize this land for free and, um, and profit off of it. But the truth is, is that if we were as taxpayers to manage all of that land, it would cost us a considerable amount of money each year, more than a lot of people understand. My dad's a land planner and I, the numbers that they put on managing wildlands in America are actually pretty huge. So when you consider what those ranchers are doing, they're paying to use the land to the government, and then they're managing it with um, ruminants that would have originally been out there managing that land. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a system that, that works. It's beneficial to everybody. Um, and I mean, it's, it's just the way that, you know, I think we need to have a little more education around all of this stuff so people understand how it, how it fits together. I forgot where I was going with that, but. 
Well, you know, it's fascinating because just like you were saying, you know, BLM, one, they took this land unconstitutionally, for lack of better, like for a longer argument or whatever. And it is kind of incredible. Hey, if we let these ranchers graze it and utilize it, it's going to maintain it. It's going to improve it. Okay. So the land is going to be managed for lack of a better term, relatively free. The rancher in turn is getting fodder to grow his cow out. The cow then gets slaughtered to uh, feed the community. And it is a literally like a relatively speaking, a perfect system that's completely natural. Um, that is creates abundance versus no, uh, call. I, the other thing I really love is, you know how we're going to fix this? Kill all the animals. Like we should just kill the animals and bury them in a hole. Like where's PETA? Like <laughs> I, you know, there was a, a animal rights activist who was making the argument, um, that you know, cause somebody was asking her, well, what's going to happen to all the cows if there's not a, an economically viable system behind managing them and caring for them. And her answer was, well, they're, they're domestic animals. We created them. They don't need to exist anyway. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. apparently nobody's ever explained to her where <laughs> heritage breeds come from or, you know, going yeah. back into time. But um, mm -hmm. that was the actual perspective of this, you know, I forget her name, but she she runs a, a large vegan movement, or at least she did several mm -hmm. years ago when I found that quote. But she was she she literally just felt they didn't have a reason that a a place on our earth. I mean, that's not animal rights. That's not animal welfare. That's something else. I don't even know what you'd put on it. Yeah. And the, the same people really don't think that any of us should exist or have rights to live, you know, which is why we have to reduce the population to this Malthusian level of sustainability. And that's the same thing, like with all their code words, sustainability, it's always the opposite, you know, the code word is sustainability. The definition is destroy everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the words have been overused over the years. My wife and I were just talking about this the other day because on our logo currently, it says regenerative, sustainable, and humane. But every single one of those words has been yeah. overused and abused and has many different meanings now that um, it's like we need a new new tagline or something <laughs> yeah yeah we need we need to redefine a new word for the new the new dictionary <laughs> yeah and that's that's how they do it though right there's well we take a good word we'll redefine it for our cause and then what what that does is that erases history because now if you go back and you read a book from 50 years ago and it says regenerable regenerable sustainable well now that that word means something completely different or maybe the exact opposite so that's how you can literally burn a book without lighting a match you know just continue to redefine the words well and but, i think that in many ways it feels like that's what's happening to our agrarian society right now is they're trying to burn the book on it and mm -hmm. um and in in that transition, replace it with all of these other patented food products. And, you know, we just had the state of Tennessee have to pass a law that said, if you put MRNA vaccines in your food, it has to be labeled as a pharmaceuticals. And, and that's because they're actually doing this now. I mean, there was wow. a case where they had grown a corn crop to um, with, with a vaccine in it for hogs. And then after the corn crop had been harvested, that vaccine had somehow transferred to soybeans, which were supposed to go to people. Um, yeah. They caught it and had to kill or get rid of about 500 bushels or so. So with this food transition away from the natural foods, what, what you and I want to eat, we're also seeing this metamorphosis of these creations that are that are being planted in, in mass. You know, it's not just you know, in a lab anymore. It's actually out there to the point where you have to have a state pass a bill that says you're going to have to label that food as a pharmaceutical in our state. But, um, and, it, you know, we were, you were talking a little bit ago about, um, you know, controlling 
the uh, some of the the farmers when we look at um the the money generation that comes out of some of these narratives and you look at this you know moving towards green energy and, and forcing farmers to upgrade to certain electrical equipment and, and upgrade their farms. It's putting all of those farmers, those larger farmers that are supplying the system into a great deal of debt to the banks um, by forcing them. And they force them because if you want to get a loan, um, you know, a lot of these banks are aligned with a global uh, agenda to you know, basically say, we're not going to lend you money unless you make these upgrades. And mm -hmm. so for those large industrial farms to stay in production, they then have to go through these upgrades to be able to get their operating loans from the banks. And it basically creates a new, um, a, a new debt system of putting these people into debt, enslaving them to, yeah. to further control. Um, and that is why you had about over a dozen agricultural commissioners write letters not to our representatives but to the banks saying hey look you're going to disrupt our entire country's food supply by so. by forcing these these guys to do this um but that stuff is happening every day across this country and around the world i mean that's why you have farmers protesting in europe right now is, yeah um, that, and that's what i think makes these topics way more relevant is you know your average troll or talking pointer or agenda or propagandist, you know, whether it's some PETA person or whatever, they can say all these platitudes or these talking points, but these approaches have been already been implemented across the planet. And we see the impact of it, the negative impact of it. We, and we can, so it's not like, Oh, this might happen. No, look, they did this over here. Look, they did. They already did this in the Netherlands and look at the result, you know, so it's not like we're trying to guess or, you know, once again, like, oh, you're being a fear monger by saying, you know, well, this could potentially do this. No, this is the agenda. It is a global agenda. Um, there are transnational corporations involved. There is this banking cartel that's clearly involved and the end game is that you will own nothing and somehow be happy. And I, you know, and what's that all look like? How does that work? How could that be possible? Well, well, we're watching it, you know, we're watching it and they'll, they'll take away the dirt a square inch at a time. They'll take away our freedom and our Liberty an inch at a time. They'll take away natural. It's so weird. Like it's so 1984 that we have to have this conversation about natural food like for one the term food that like it should be you know jumbo shrimp like no this is like food should be natural and we should <laughs> want natural food and if food ceases to be natural i would say that it ceases to be food <laughs> but the solution is an mrna soybean <laughs> yeah well you know it's it's interesting if you look at I mean, this has actually happened throughout history. If you if you look at our obsession with grains and processed foods, mm -hmm. it goes way back. And it does have, it moving away from what our bodies were designed to eat, does have consequences. And you can see that in filming our bison documentary, we've been th to numerous um, Native American reservations across the United States. And what happened with them was their food supply was literally wiped out by the government. It was, that's part of the bison story is that they were wiped out to control their food supply. And then they were given grain rations mm -hmm. and other things that they had to create food from that would be then more processed than what their bodies were able to handle. And as a result, you've seen all sorts of health impacts um, depression and other issues come out from within those communities. And, you know, it's almost like if you if you look at that, that's very small scale compared to what they're trying to do now on a much larger scale. I mean, and they're they're succeeding at it because they've gotten everybody to believe that if we don't do this, we're going to hit some sort of apocalyptic scenario because of the gas of life being out of out of balance or something like that. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, the Netherlands 
people think this is a conspiracy theory. The first time I showed somebody the World Economic website, World Economic Forum website, they thought it was a fake organization, right? Because it <laughs> it does seem it seems that so far out of whack. But is it, it they are real? Their talking head sounds like Doctor Evil and dresses like some intergalactic comic book uh, arc arc enemy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could it could be. I mean, it, they almost make it seem unbelievable. It's so real. Yeah. I mean, really, if you look at, you know, the 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 global picture right now, the U.N. is really kind of the propaganda tool and the W.E.F. is the economic side mm -hmm. of, of yeah. that. They're the ones implementing these things. But if, when you look at the Netherlands, they wanted to make the Netherlands the new one of the new W.E.F. food hubs. Mm -hmm. It just happens that the Netherlands also feeds a lot of Europe. I mean, they used to produce m most of the food for Europe. So it's the perfect, mm -hmm. you know, opportunity. And if you look at the Netherlands now, they've got, you know, some of the largest alternative protein plants going up. It's it's completely changed. They are succeeding at what they said they wanted to do. So it's not like, you know, these are conspiracy theories or, or things that aren't happening. They actually are happening. These are plans that some people that we none of us elected i mean we don't have a vote in the un or the wef yeah. but they've come up with these ideas and they they're implementing them and they're impacting people on a on a global scale um and then they get away with it because they they've convinced a lot of people that if we don't do this we don't make these sacrifices and these transitions that we're going to burn up in a few years which none and, of that's going to make a difference. And, and it's fascinating, like even like you were mentioning the Seminole Indians, right? I, I mean, the Native Americans. And I, I think of the Seminoles um, and how that there is so much talk of um, heritage and all these different things. And like we have all these different heritage months and we're trying to maintain this heritage. But the, the solution for the Seminoles is the Hard Rock Casino. You know, so they can generate all this revenue other than historically uh, all of the wisdom that they had with um, animals and growing food and all the all these heritage type um, historical facts. Uh, that's all, you know, uh, hang all that junk. That's all stupid. You know, the solution for the Seminoles is they need to uh, buy Wall Street own the hard rock casino and then get dividends and all this. Stuff. I mean, it's so, if it wasn't real, it would just seem so fake, but uh, that's the solution. It's so bizarre. I mean, it's, it's very, very strange. strange well, world. somebody told us, maybe we were on the wind river, river reservation. He said that politics in the native American community make, Democrats and Republicans look tame, but, um, basically, I mean, you, you do have, I think, you know, everywhere you've got different viewpoints. There are, there are groups that are out there that are working and they're the ones that we've worked with every day to try and bring their traditions back to their, their, their young ones. But even they will tell you when we introduce the idea of, you know, growing community gardens on the reservation and these things and that a lot of, they had a lot of negative reactions yeah. um, because there are a lot of people who have been, you know, trained otherwise. So it's almost, it, I mean, they're fighting the same battle right now that you and I are as far as, yeah. Hey, we need to get back to our traditional ways or traditional values. Looks, look what it's looks, how it's impacting us. Um, but you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's sad, but at least, you know, when you, if you can see what has happened there you, and you can see how it's being implemented on a larger scale now, um, you, I mean, hopefully people will wake up to it and, and realize that, you know, the direction we're being led is not healthy for us. It's not better for us. Um, and, you know, destroying these operations that raise animals across our country is not going to help the ecosystem. You know, it's, it, right. if anything, it will destroy areas of it. I mean, Alan Savory discovered his philosophy by visiting a national park that didn't have any animals in it. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what's so, uh, what's so interesting is just the, 
the fact that you can observe, you know, we, we moved from the Northeast 10 years ago and for whatever reason, you know, we felt a really strong call to live a more simple agrarian type lifestyle. And I talk about it all the time uh, on, on the podcast and on the channel about uh, living an intentional, slower lifestyle, uh, void of hyper consumerism. I, I read the book, The Millionaire Next Door, and it kind of changed my thinking on a lot of things, you know, and basically the crux of the book is about hyper consumerism and a debt based economy. You know, yeah, I and, read that book when I was 14. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it was a great yeah. book. But no, I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, we've, in our case, we weren't looking for it. We were kind of forced into it saying, hey, look, this is now going to be your lifestyle. You know, forget, forget the corporate world you came from. This is, this is it. And, um, you know, I think it takes, a lot of sacrifice for a lot of people. It takes a lot of adjusting. You're not going to be able to go out and, you know, do the things that you used to do to entertain yourself. Yep. And you're going to have to sacrifice entertainment altogether just to manage mm -hmm. your life. But for centuries, you know, up until recent modern times, people have had to work for their food. They've had to put the effort in to get something out of it. Um, it, it's only been a, a modern scenario where, and, and, it, and I think it will end up being a very short time in history where food was so inexpensive, it was less than 25% of your budget or 15% of your budget for a lot of people. Now we're starting to see that change again. And there was a point in time where all you did all day long was work to be able to feed yourself just like every other species on this planet. Yep. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a break from reality. And, um, I think that there's, there's an obsession that has built a, of, of these distractions that really, if you think about it in life, don't mean a dang thing, you know, yep. it's, it's like, you're mentioning the the Seminoles with the casinos. Now, how important is that compared to, you know, teaching your kids your old ways of, of how to how to hunt, how to mm -hmm. how to preserve food? Um, and that's where, you know, I kind of I look at things today, and I'm like, I mean, even with our kids, we do the best we can to share with them this lifestyle, but. Um, I mean, some of them are just way too distracted. I mean, they grow up with a cell phone. <laughs> yep. So, okay. So you were kind of, for lack of a better term, forced into this lifestyle. So do you regret it? Oh, no, absolutely not. I, I, I guess when I say the word forced, it was, you know, I didn't, we didn't have any other choice. We were put yeah. in a position where yeah. we had to re you know, reinvent Re ourselves and, sure. You know, I think do, we're all led. What was that? Why don't you regret it? Because this obviously, you know, obviously you were, you guys were going down one path and you were doing this corporate thing and then the circumstance changed and here you are. So, you know, I think it's a great illustration because, you know, we, we kind of chose to do this, you know what I mean? And we saw it as a necessity, but now you're coming from a little different angle and it was, it was, you didn't really have a choice and you were kind of forced into it. So why don't you regret it? Well, um, for, for the overall picture, it's a lot more rewarding. I mean, exactly. the, our lives are a lot happier now, a lot less stressful than they were. Even if we go through periods of time where we feel flat broke, we're not stressed out about it because we're, yeah. we, we know that we have everything that we we need to have, but, um, you know, there, when we moved out to our farm, if there was something we needed, if there was a piece of equipment that broke, we just went out and bought a new one because that's what we did. Um, now if something breaks mm -hmm. in, in less amount of time without having to, you know, spend a lot of effort earning the money to go buy something, we can walk out there and fix it because we're a lot more knowledgeable. So I think, um, you know, it, the, for us, it was a challenge at first because we had to learn a lot. But um, as 
time has gone by, the more that we've learned, um, the, the health benefits of eating raw foods and, yeah. and, and milk and, and things like that, that we've picked up from getting away from, I mean, it's like, I, for us, the first time we took an egg off our farm and cracked it into the skillet, we were seeing who was going to eat it first, you know, cause it was just mm -hmm. a weird thing to us. Yeah. Now we, we, it's a normal thing, you know, it's normal to eat food that comes right off the farm, right from an animal. But it, it was actually, if we were scared of it at first, like, is something going to be wrong with it? But um, I would say that overall, we feel healthier, we're happier, we have more time, we spend all almost all of our time with our kids. I mean, our kids are homeschooled. Um, they still socialize. That's mm -hmm. people who think homeschool kids aren't socialized have never, you know, been a part of the community, but they, they have friends, they go out, they socialize. We're more engaged with our community because we have more time to be engaged. So after that tough transition of kind of being forced into economic decline, having to climb out and learn how to do things on our own, we've come out on the other side more free than we ever were before. I mean, before we, we used, my wife and I both used to make a lot of money, but it, we, mm -hmm. we were, we felt like we were enslaved to that lifestyle and it was stressful. And, and the reason my take on that, it, I, I was a financial planner for 11 years. And, um, my take on that is that corporate concrete jungle sidewalk lifestyle is completely sy synthetic. It's completely unsustainable. Um, it's, it's relatively what you find retrospectively is it's empty, right? And now what are you saying? Oh, before if the tractor broke, you know, well, we would just buy a new one, right? But now talk about sustainability and resiliency. Now you have the knowledge to go out and fix it, right? And that is sustainable. That is, uh, I mean, in a very real way, I realize everybody can't grow their own food. I realize but we do all need each other. And so the people that can't grow their own food better wake up and realize that they better meet somebody that can grow their food for them unless they want to eat like government soy kibble or whatever it's going to be, whatever the new cricket flavored Funko pop or whatever. But, um, you know, we need to support each other and just learning these life skills. I mean, the dividends are certainly not monetary, but holistically as a lifestyle and well-being. And I mean, how much how much is your health worth? I mean, how much is just feeling better and having more energy and being able to spend more time with your family and train your own children and teach them your core values rather than some government propaganda institution like um, brainwashing them to be a good cog in the, you know, transnational machine. Um, there, there's so much, uh, value that, that it's, you cannot put a, a monetary number on it. Well, that's the other thing too, is, you know, you mentioned monetary sustainability, everything that we're talking about is real. It, it it's, yeah. it's tangible. It's real. When you think about money and currency in general, it's all fake. It's based on people's perception that a dollar bill has value. And we're seeing that perception die every single day. I mean, eventually that focus is not, it's not going to be around. And it's not going to matter how many dollar bills you have in your bank account if nobody wants to accept them. If they want to barter and trade for something instead because the dollar has no value, um, what what worth do you have in, in that capacity? But we've we've all become a slave to the concept of currency. And, you know, the more you learn to do on your own, the more you food you grow, the less you rely on that currency to sustain you. Um, and, and in many ways, the wealthier you become because your, your resources become more abundant. Um, so it's, it's an interesting concept, but I've come to the conclusion over the years that, you know, currency is just, um, an illusion. And it's one that we've all bought into and mm -hmm. we've become enslaved to because we have to pay our taxes in that currency. We have to, we're forced to trade in that currency. 
And now they're trying to digitalize it to control it even more. I mean, it has always been from the, from its very beginning, a mechanism to control the populace. Um, So, you know, what we're, what we're talking about, we're talking about spending time with the family, having knowledge and skills, being able to grow our own food, that type of lifestyle. That's all real. That's an investment that nobody's, going to be able to destroy or is going to fall apart when society realizes, oh, this paper has no intrinsic value anymore. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I still, uh, I still work in an office four days a week and we, we grow a lot of chicken eggs and I'll take my eggs in to the office and the guys buy them from me for five, five bucks a dozen, you know, and it's way better than what they can buy in the store. And, you know, it's all set in my feed bill. I'm providing them with a high quality product and how much ve- like, and this, this goes back to my point of knowing your farmer shaking a rancher's hand um, is how, I mean, one, that part is so fulfilling to be able to provide something to somebody else and they appreciate it. And, um, and it's so part of this real transaction versus going to Walmart in some, you know, uh, cold box and pulling out a dozen eggs that came from who knows where that have been refrigerated for how knows long, like, it's just like, and, but then to be in this real world with real interaction, um, real knowledge and tangible stuff, like that, that's my exact point is like, I think if you're outside of that, You are in a synthetic, you know, all these uh, like Elon Musk, you know, they want to talk about simulation theory and, you know, maybe we're all just in a simulation. My contention is if you're living in in an artificial life that's on concrete and it's in a high rise, like 90 stories high, like I think you are in a simulation. I think it's completely synthetic. It's a total derivative of the real world. But the reality that maybe you are in that high rise, right? If you're living in that synthetic derivative, a derivative is a derivative of something. And when you erase that something, when you erase that real world, the derivative will cease to exist. Yeah. You know, sometimes I think that we're living in a simulation of freedom that they're slowly trying to take back too. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. No, that's absolutely true. I mean, if you look at with at the same time, we've seen this attack on farming, homesteading, agriculture. We've also seen this attack on our freedoms of speech or our communication, like you and I were talking about earlier, just censorship. And they they use economic, you know, penalties to be able to censor people, to Mm -hmm. silence them, make sure that they can't continue to, to use their voices, but, um, that's been, you know, it's a fascinating thing. My wife and I have a conversation all the time was, you know, America ever truly freed or was it just some sort of simulation that now they're trying to take back, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's also one of those things you start to value more when you do take a step outside of society and you start to recognize, you know, all that life actually has to offer. You certainly, I think, value that freedom a lot more than you do in a high rise. <laughs> yeah. And you, va- you just value all the real tangible things of life, you know, like that first egg you cracked into that pan. You're like, well, I know where this egg came from. I know what the chicken that laid it, I know what they ate. I know, you know, how they're treated. I know how they're managed. So relatively speaking, and that's what's so weird about the synthetic society is like nobody, I mean, you you get, you buy that carton of eggs at Walmart or you go to that restaurant, right? And the egg comes out in your plate and nobody is like, oh, I wonder where that came from. I wonder who touched it. I wonder how they cooked it and all these different things, right? All these different factors. Um, but taking that control back and knowing you know growing the egg and collecting the egg and crack it there there's and you know we have there's an inordinate amount of mental illness 
and everything's in society today. And I think that a large percentage of it is because of this synthetic derivative type lifestyle that is not connected to anything real. And so of course it'll create schizophrenia and, you know, uh, delusion, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's a psychological, um, it, it creates psychological damage to your brain just being disconnected. Yeah, I, I could see that. And, and the other thing is, is that food that pops out on your plate in restaurants, the food you grab in grocery stores, nobody questions it. Uh, and I, and, and it, it gives, you know, in my perspective, the re- regulatory bodies even more control because people feel yeah. that they can eat these things safely and nothing's going to happen to them. But we, the more research you do on the ingredients of the things you buy in the store, the more research you do on, you know, the, the chemicals put into the animals that are, you know, being served on, in the store shelves, the more you realize that that food is not safe, you know, but then, you know, it's like I said, when we moved out to the country, we got some chickens. The first time we, you know, had an egg, we went through the same experience. First time we harvested a rabbit, we were just kind of like, can we eat it? Is it real food? And that's, you know, that's the brainwashing that's yeah. happened over over the years, whereas that food is way safer than anything you're going to get off of a grocery store shelf. I mean, if you're worried about things, if you're worried about what you're eating, look into some of those ingredients that, you know, the synthetic chemicals that you see on the, the labels of the packaging. I mean, none of that is real. Our bodies don't break it down the way that we do the, the real, you know, proteins and, and things that we need. But. Yeah, same thing as seed oils. You know, seed oils is an experiment, is a post World War One experiment. Uh, Crisco, I think, was track grease on like World War One tanks, and then they turned it, it, converted it into a food product. And we have been this seed oil experiment of like, and and I encourage everybody to look into seed oils because it is what's killing most people, and it, it's just a, it's a product of this highly processed food process um and i mean we we have no idea of the long-term ramifications because 100 years ago these seed oils didn't even exist we certainly didn't consume them and now they are in everything (laughs) everything remotely yeah that's uh, my wife has outlawed seed oils in our house for a few years now (laughs) yeah yeah but they're scary (laughs) yeah they're not consumable, but we do it anyway. They tend well, to this, sit in the belly. <laughs> this has been a great conversation, Charlie. Uh, so our listeners know, where where can everybody find you? Where can they get your information? Well, we've got our YouTube channel, Yanasa TV. Um, we also, our nonprofit is called Meet My Neighbor Productions. Um, that has its own YouTube channel that's just, it, it just has agriculture and and videos from us filming farms um if you if you want commentary and conversations like this you know you tv um and those are where you can find us right now we we've, we've been hoping to expand and do more things but with the the bison documentary the last several years it's tied up a lot of our time we've been all across the country in canada filming that so <laughs> we've just kind of stuck to those two main avenues for now Great. Well, you know, I really appreciate the information you put out and it's incredibly relevant and it definitely impacts us. And I think it's really important. And I think this whole educational component of just educating people. And then, you know, I commend you for homeschooling your children. Um, If anything is going to change anything for better in this American society, or dare I say around the world, is people taking control of the education and training of their own children. Uh, And then these kids are going to grow up. They're going to make up their own mind. They're going to make their own decisions. But at a minimum, at least we aren't outsourcing their education to who knows what and what knows what. And uh, so I I greatly appreciate that. Yep. We, uh, I, I mean, I will say with homeschooling, that's another thing that people are afraid to do. Mm-hmm. Your kids learn 10 times better in an environment where it's coming naturally to them 
than they do in a school environment. Our 14 year old was failing in the public school system way behind. I mean, and to be behind in the public school system now is to really be behind because every kid is behind. So since we've been uh, homeschooling him, he has gotten ahead and he scores at the top of his grade points. And you would think as a parent, you know, you're worried because they're sitting there Mm -hmm. doing work and you're trying to help them out the best you can, but you're not a, a teacher. But then you realize at the end of the day that the environment you've put them in is more natural for them to be able to learn and retain the information. And they they just they thrive and you can control what information it is you're giving them and you're not feeding them. There are classes like an entire hour spent in school on stuff that kids really shouldn't even be learning about. We shouldn't be exposing them to until they're, you know, much older, but they do it. (laughs) Yeah. It's so fascinating. It goes right back into our topic, right? Like, well, I can't grow my own food. I'm not a farmer, right? Well, you can try, you know, and it's the same thing with training your own children, uh, especially with all the tools we have today. You know, um, you, what you do is when you try, you'll find out that they're much happier. You're much happier. They're getting a much broader, better, uh, education in an incredibly much shorter period of time to, to now they have more free time. They have more peace of mind. Um, they have more lifestyle, you know, all these things that everybody talks about that we want. And that's what homeschooling and an agrarian lifestyle. Um, I think they kind of fit hand in hand and, uh, it, it's great to just hear people that are taking control um, of, of their food and taking control of the educational component because that it's the only way that anything's going to be fixed. If, if we just keep farming out our food and if we keep farming out our kids, we're going to end up in a complete dystopia. I think we almost are. <laughs> <laughs> so we are the resistance. So if you are listening to this transmission, you are the resistance. Thank you so much right. for watching today, y'all. Uh, Charlie, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming on. And remember, y'all, stay fearless, my friends.